John's Gospel, chapter 2. I'm going to read from two passages of scripture this morning, try to marry uh, them both together, make some sense out of it. John's Gospel, chapter 2, going to start reading at verse 1 through um, 1 through 10. And then we're going to jump to Ephesians, chapter 5. Mm-hmm. Good to see each and every one of you all in the house of the Lord. Amen. Zot's home from school. Are you home from school? You're just home this weekend. I can't hear you. Oh, it's wonderful. Amen. She just finished her junior year. Right? I'm sorry. You have one semester left and you graduated from college. Wow. Amen. Terribly proud. Terribly proud of her. Amen. Good to see that you brought your parents to church this morning. Amen. Amen. John's Gospel, chapter, um, chapter, uh, I said five, right? No, two. Okay. I said Ephesians, chapter five, right? Okay. I remember five was in there somewhere. John's Gospel, chapter two, and then Ephesians, chapter five. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And the third day there was a marriage in Canaan of Galilee. The mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they lacked wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were uh, set there six water pots of stone after the manner of the purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Jesus saith unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, draw some out now and bear it unto the governor of the feast. And they bore it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not from where it was, but the servants who drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Okay, we're gonna stop reading right there. Thou hast kept the good wine until now. Go jump to Ephesians chapter five. Ephesians chapter 5, verse uh, 18. Got it? You got it? Yes. Okay. It says, be not drunk with wine in excess, which is in excess, but be filled with the Spirit, Mm -hmm. speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart unto the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and for the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And be not drunk with wine, in which is in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. I want to continue what we started on last week, uh, and I want to talk this morning about being filled with the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Being filled with the Spirit this morning. By your heads, I want to pray. God, thank you for your goodness, your mercy, your kindness. Thank you for your spirit that gives us life. Thank you that this is the day that you've made and we rejoice and we'll be glad in it. Thank you that you've kept us safe one more week. Thank you that we have time to come into your sanctuary and partake of your word. I pray, God, in Jesus' name, that you would anoint me to preach your gospel. Give me the words of eternal life this morning. Give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of Jesus Christ that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. To this end, God, I give your name all the glory and all the praise, and I trust you to do it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. Thank you, choir. Amen. Thank you, musicians. A little more volume. Just a tad bit more volume. It was cold this morning. I had to turn on my heat this morning. I had to turn it off. It's, it's chilly, but it's Chicago. So it's, it's what it is this morning. God is good. I, I want to continue um, what we talked about on last week, talking about the Spirit of God or the Holy Ghost and what that means and 
um, the different experiences that God gives us with the Holy Ghost. I told you last week that we trace uh, American Pentecostalism to a revival meeting that happened in 1906, between 1906, from 1906 to 1915 in Los Angeles that started at Azusa Street uh, by a, a, uh, a Baptist preacher by the name of William J. Seymour uh, who believed that there was more to our experience with God um, than just salvation. That the first work of the Spirit was salvation, the second work of the Spirit was sanctification, and the third work of the Spirit is the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Uh, him along, and it was an inter, in, integrated meeting, uh, it was interracial. Um, there were uh, uh, many representatives of religions that were there. There were Quakers there. There were Presbyterians and Lutherans, and there were Catholics there. Um, particularly, there was a, uh, a man there by the name of C.H. Mason, Charles Harrison Mason, um, who um, waited in the room with them, and these saints had re a revival that lasted years, and they were in church believing that there was more to their experience with God uh, than just salvation, that there was a deeper experience. There is uh, no longing for food unless you're hungry. Uh, the desire to be filled with the Spirit must come from the soul who believes that God has more for me than I am experiencing right now. I cannot teach you how to be hungry. Either you're hungry or you're not hungry. Right. You can have a gourmet meal placed in front of you, but if you are not hungry for it, the, 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 the meal means nothing because you have no desire for it. David says, as the heart panted after the water brook, so my soul pants after thee. David understands that, that I have a longing for God. And if you do not have a longing for God, you will never ascertain God. He says, seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. If He says that if you do not seek me, you will not find me. If you do not knock on the door, I'm not just going to wake up in the morning and open the door because nobody's knocking. I only knock because there's somebody at the door. And if you don't learn how to knock at the door of God and ask God to say that there's more to my life than what I am experiencing right now and I feel empty. How many of you have ever felt empty before? How many of you all have ever went after some things and then when you got it, you realized it wasn't all that you thought it was cracked up to be and the experience left you a little wanting and you, 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 you desired it so much and you put so much value on it that when the experience happened, it wasn't everything that you thought it was going to be. It is the issue of the barren spirit that says that I can have this and I can have that and we can get houses and cars and relationships and all those different kind of things. But I want you to understand there is nothing in life that will ever satisfy you like Jesus. <laughs> There's nothing that will ever fill your heart the way the spirit of God can fill your heart. And so in the Bible, I want you to understand is that uh, uh, in, in Genesis chapter 2, he says, let us make man in our own image and in our likeness. And the Bible says that he formed man out of the dust of the ground. He created a vessel, but humanity was not alive until he breathed into right. what he had formed because God always desires to feel what he has formed. And so if he has formed you, he has the desire to be in you and to yeah. feel you. Yeah. I declare to you is that we would not be so needy sometimes for things, for stuff, chasing after things and stuff and people and all those different kind of things. Uh, uh, if we had learned how to let God fill us in ways. The, the, the reason some of our relationships fail and reasons why our degrees sometimes fail us and every some, none of the jobs fail us is because we are looking for temporal things to fill uh, eternal need. And, and, and you cannot have things in your life and put more value on them to understand that the true blessings of life cannot be computed or counted. That the true blessings of life are hidden in the reservoir of the human heart. And it was God's desire to fill you on the inside. People should get the overflow of what you have been filled with. Mm -hmm. So if you're filled with hate, 
If you're filled with anger, if you're filled with bitterness, that's the overflow of what you're going to give other people. So God says, here's what I want to do. I want to do an exchange. I want to exchange your stony heart. You know, all of the stuff you have, and I want to put in you a new heart. He says that I want to give you a heart transplant. I want to be the beat of your heart so you can always understand and discern around you that there's nothing in life that you could ever have or lose that is going to compare to me. In my tradition coming up, we said that the evidence of the Spirit was speaking in tongues. Right. And we call this the baptism right. of the Spirit. In a little while, we're going to have a water baptism, and we're going to talk more about baptism. But, but, but the, in my tradition, we said that you weren't filled with the Holy Ghost until you have the evidence of speaking in tongues. I don't want to say that that's wrong. I want to, I want to add to that. It may be a little incomplete. Number one, The Bible says none can come to the Father, save the Spirit, draw him. And so people ask me sometimes, uh, do I have to ask for the Holy Ghost when I am born again? No, you do not have to ask for the Holy Ghost because it was the Holy Ghost that drew you unto God himself. You cannot come to God unless the Spirit of God drew you. It is not that you got emotional one Sunday and got in your feelings and came up when the preacher said, uh, do you want to be saved? No, no, no. There was a time. He says, before I formed you, I knew you. I had a set moment that you were going to recognize who I was and it was all orchestrated by the spirit yeah. so when God comes he says I, you cannot come to me save the spirit of God draw you that is the spirit of God his function in salvation number two the spirit of God is functioning in sanctification because to be saved means that I was over there but now I am over here I could not get over here unless there was an agent to move me to where I needed to be. And so when I was in sin, I was in the kingdom of darkness, but he has translated me into the kingdom of his dear son. The the Holy Ghost is the sanctifying agent that moved me away from sin, away from my past. He was able to cut the cord between me and all of the stuff that was chasing me, and so I have been made free. Thank you, Lord. Yes. We talked about last week, there's therefore now no condemnation. What the Spirit of God did in salvation was expunged my record. Yeah. That means that if you looked at my file, you cannot see any offense because it has been taken away. That, that, that God has remitted my sins. And he has taken it totally away and he moved me to where the devil couldn't have me again. Yes. I have been translated from the kingdom of darkness into his kingdom of his dear son. That is God in sanctification. Now, the Bible begins to go on to say that I want you to be filled with the spirit. Now, being filled with the spirit is another experience. Okay, so if if I take, uh, if I had a, a box in here and I set it on fire, okay, we could all understand the truth that there is fire in the building. Okay. Take a box, set it on fire, put it in the middle of the floor, and we can all look at the fire and say that there's fire in the building. But if I let the fire burn long enough, it will consume everything in the house, so much so that people on the outside can recognize that there's fire in the house. There's a difference between having fire in the house and the house being on fire. What we want is for God by his spirit to set the house on fire. That what happens down on the inside can show up on the outside. What I want to do is be consumed. I want to be filled with the fire of the Holy Ghost so that I can walk right. So I can talk right. So that when I tell you there's therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, you can actually believe it because the Spirit of God has set you on fire from the inside. Now, we says that the evidence of the house being on fire when I was a child was the, the, the speaking in another tongue. It is what in Greek we call glossolalia. It is, it is the, the, what Paul begins to say, the tongues of angels. That, that, that there is a language to the spirit, that there are linguistics to God, that, that, that 
on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says that the spirit came like a mighty rushing wind and sat on each of them and they began to speak in other tongues. But the Bible begins to say that those around them begin to understand in their own language what they were saying. Right. So there were Jews from different parts, various diverse Jews coming and they said that I don't understand how I can understand what you're saying since you have never learned my dialect. Yeah. But there is a dialect of heaven that is given to the church. This is it. To communicate to the world. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. The language of the spirit is given to the church so we can communicate the love of God to a world who does not know him. One of the things that he says that the Spirit of God was going to be for us, and we talked about it last week, was going to be a witness. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It is going to be a witness. He says, Jesus says that if I don't go, the Spirit of God can't come, but you're going to be my witnesses in Judea and, and other most parts of the world. I did not understand this until I experienced what I experienced last year. What he is saying to them is that they're going to know you belong to me because when I go, you are going to be able to speak for me because you knew me. So the other week, I, uh, 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 the, the seminary called and said they wanted to give my, my dad an award. Uh, they wanted to recognize his, his, his educational pursuits as he was getting a Master's of Divinity degree. They called me because they could not get him on the phone. I became his representative. Yeah. I stood in for him when he could not stand in for himself. And they said, since you are related to him, on, you become his representative in the earth. Come on, sir. Jesus says, I'm going to go away. Yeah. But you are going to speak for me in the earth, and the reason you have authority to speak for me is because you were with me. Yeah. He says that here's what I'm going to do. You are going to be my witnesses, but I am going to give you a witness, so when you forget what you need to say, the Holy Ghost will speak down in your ear and bring back things, all things, to your remembrance. Yeah. The function of the Spirit is to help me remember what Jesus said. Now, when I was a kid and I heard this scripture, um, uh, I, I, they said that the Spirit of God will bring all things back to my remembrance. So I thought I did not have to study for the test. <laughs> so I go in the classroom with my deep Pentecostal self and, and pray over this test that the Lord would bring it back to my remembrance. What I did not know or understand that you have to put something in before it can come out. If you don't remember something, you can't remember anything. He cannot bring something back to you that wasn't already in you. So the function of the spirit is to bring back to me that when I get in a tight and I don't know what to do, the Holy Ghost is going to help me remember, oh, I can do all things yes, sir. through yes, sir. Christ. Yes. Help me to remember yes. that as we know that all things all work things. together, that this is going to work out, that, that since he foreknew me and he ordained me that, that I am not in this by myself, the Holy Ghost will bear witness to the fact that I belong to him. Yes. Okay. And so when you communicate with God, it is, it is what uh, I believe it was. It was Dorothy Love Coates. Uh, uh, I don't know somebody. It was a. It was the song that said that God is still on the throne. Yeah. There's a line in the stanza of the verse that says, "God is still on the throne, and within your bosom, yeah. you have a phone." Yeah. Yeah. The, the 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 metaphor is, your spirit is like a phone, and it has two functions. You can ring out. And whoever wants to talk to you can ring in. When you got born again, the Holy Ghost is like your phone. That when I need to be able to talk to him, I can call him. Because God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So I have to be able to communicate to God in the right frequency. Okay? So God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So in my spirit, I have the ability to communicate with God because he is a spirit. So I can dial out. But the wonderful thing about it is that he can dial in. And so when he needs to talk to me, he picks up the phone on his end and is able to get me because I have been filled with his spirit. Yeah. The, the, the function of being filled 
with the Spirit is an experience that most believers do not have because you have to ask for it yes. to be filled. Yes, you have the Holy Spirit, but there's a deeper experience to walking with God, and that is being filled with the Spirit. Yes. You must desire it. All you have to do is ask it. When I was coming up, when I was coming up in church, we used to have what we call tearing service. Mm -hmm. Y'all may not know nothing about that, but let me explain to you. Um, every Friday night, they would show us these rapture movies. Right. And they would scare us. So we got saved every Friday, every Friday night. Right. Just in case some of it wore off on Monday or Tuesday, right. we would get saved all over again. Now, I want you to understand, let me put a pin right here. It says that once you are saved, you do not have to get saved all over again. Right. Yeah. You are saved once, completely. You are wholly saved. Uh, but it was just a practice. It was Youth Sunday, Youth Friday. And so after that, after we got saved, they said, well, you can't leave here without having the Spirit of God. Because they understood that the only thing that's going to keep you from day to day is having the Spirit. Left up to your own devices, you might wander away, but you needed the Spirit. So they would take everything from the altar, and they would put us on, on the altar, put us on our knees. And they get around us, adults would get around us, and they say, give up. <laughs> Hold on. Let go, shoot, dribble, walk, run, call him, call him, he's able, Jesus, say Jesus, 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 now get over in your ear and start clapping, and then listen, by the time you got off that altar, you had it, because you had to really, really work hard for it, I mean, it was something you had to put an effort in, but, 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 but we have never had that in our church, because what we understand is that one of the things that Jesus says to his disciples is receive ye the Holy Ghost. Yes. Yes. I don't have to work for what he has already allocated. All I have to do is ask for it. So some of you all may say how, how can I experience this deeper experience with the Spirit? All you have to do is ask for it. Yes. He says that I withhold nothing. I'm not going to withhold myself if you want it, but you have to want it. Right. And, and some of us spend most of our, our Christianity seeking so many other things. He says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Yes. Call ye upon him while he is yet near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and unrighteous man. The thoughts he says that in, in Matthew 6, he says, uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness. Then all of the other things will be added unto you. We look for all the other things first yeah. before the kingdom of God. Yeah. But there's no way, see the fault in that is that when you seek all the other things, you think that that's going to fill you. Uh -huh. There's no feeling in temporary things. What I want is what Jesus said to the woman in Samaria. He said, if you ask of me to drink, I will give you water and you would never thirst again. Yeah. I don't want to live my life being thirsty. Right. Look at somebody and they say, stop being thirsty. Stop being thirsty. <laughs> you do not have to be thirsty when you allow the Spirit of God to be a well in you of living water springing up unto everlasting life. And so today, as we look in our text, we see John is giving us the story that happens at this wedding. So Jesus is invited, him and his disciples and his mother are invited to a wedding. It is a celebration. If you've ever been to a Jewish wedding, it's terribly festive. It is a wonderful thing. And an Orthodox Jewish wedding is not just one day. It, it's a festival. Mm -hmm. It lasts four days. What, what, what happens is, is that Jesus is, is asked to come to the wedding. And the Bible says that they ran out of wine. Because what is permanent in festivities is wine. Now I'm not gonna get I'm not gonna get deep into drinking and alcohol and all those different kind of things. Here's what I want us to understand in the context of the culture of the text that part of their religiosity dealt with wine. Wine was a part of their religiosity so much so that Jesus, on the day uh, on the night that he uh, was having his last supper with his disciples, he didn't drink grape juice. I'm just saying. It was not, it wasn't Kool-Aid, it wasn't lemonade, it was wine. It, it, it was what it was. And so if you go to some, some Orthodox Catholic church, they still use wine. If you go to some Jewish synagogues, they still use wine today because wine is symbolic of celebration. Wine is symbolic of the, the, the superlative or the luxury aspects of our living. Yeah. That, that, that wine, when it is aged, becomes of great value. And you do not break out good wine for any old occasion. 
This was a marriage feast. Jesus, the disciples, his mother were there, and they were uh, being festive. But they ran out of wine. Yeah. And what do you do when you run out? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I remember. I, I I don't know if you've ever been to weddings before. I've been to a Catholic wedding before, and one of the elements of the reception, and I, I had to learn what this was, was an open bar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the open bar meant that the the, the 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 bride and the groom had paid a fee to the reception place that we are going to cover the expense for the whole bar. That means that all of the guests, you don't have to pay for it. You don't have to go buy a drink. It has already been paid for you. <laughs> Keep that in your mind. So Jesus is at the, the reception, they have run out of wine, which is embarrassing to the party because what you're supposed to do is have enough and keep it going. Right, right, right. Keep it flowing. If they can, as much as they can drink, they are supposed to have it, and it is your responsibility to furnish it. But the people who are organizing the wedding, they have run out of wine. It is, it is symbolic of humanity. That when we had finally met Jesus, we realized that we had run out of what we had. And if he does not do something to fill us, we would not be filled again. See, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to talk today uh, and focus in on the wine as much as I want to focus in on the water pots. Yeah, come on, preacher. Because I told you in the very beginning, he forms a vessel, but he desires to fill the vessel. People have been drawing out of the water pots. Let me give you uh, uh, some more about this. The water pots, the Bible says that there were about two or three of them. And when I looked up firkins, 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 what it was, it is is about 11 or 12 gallons each. And they were stone water pots. They were earthen vessels, but they were filled with the wine that the receptionist or the the governor had. And the Bible says people kept drawing out of them. They did not realize that as they were drawing, the wine was becoming lesser. They did not realize that they had no wine till there was no more wine left. My issue is, is that sometimes people will draw off of you. They will draw off of you, and they don't realize that your energy and what you have to give is getting low until you can't give it anymore. You have to understand that God put something down inside of you for somebody else. But if you do not recognize that, you know what, I'm getting low. And that somebody needs to fill me again if I am going to keep functioning. Uh The water pots were there because they were a utility of the festivity. But nobody realized that as they kept, because the Bible says we learned that they put out the good wine first. Uh Now, we have to talk about what is good wine. I've read. (laughs) It It is not... It is not the bottle that has the value. It's what is on the inside. Fermented grapes, when they have been, when they have been crushed, when they have been treated, when the, the wine is able to sit for a while, it becomes more aged and it becomes more pricey. The Bible begins to say that they get out the best wine first because if it has been fermented right, it is toxic. That means that all you need is just a little bit. Mm-hmm. All right. As I read. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> to get a, 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 a little buzz or whatever. They came to get drunk. <laughs> that was one of the, 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 the functions of them going to the wedding because I don't have to pay. They don't have to good wine there, and I don't have to pay for it. And I came to get my buzz on, as I've heard people say before. So they come to the wedding, and they put out the best wine. Everybody is supposed to be drunk, but what they had ran out, and their high began, began to come down. Uh-oh. Right. And they began to realize 
that I am not so drunk that I don't recognize that we ain't got no more wine. Yes. This is a crisis. Right. Now you have empty water pots that was filled with wine, but they are no good because they are not filled. Mm-hmm. We are not good. Well, mm-hmm. come on, preach. Unless we are filled. Come on. For the believer, so we have this treasure in earthen vessels. We are vessels. What makes me valuable is not what's on the outside. Uh It's what's on the inside. And there comes a point in your salvation that you have to be able to say, I am finished being filled with water. I want the wine that comes from the spirit. Uh And I need him to fill me. When the water pots could not speak for themselves, there was somebody that said they need to be filled again. Mm -hmm. Jesus' mother came to them, and he came to she came to Jesus and says, Jesus, they ran out of wine. Jesus says, That's none of my business. That was she said, it is none of my business. What do you want from me? My hour is not come yet. What he is saying to her is that the salvation or the Holy Spirit has not been loose to fill humanity yet. That you cannot have uh, Pentecost until we've had Passover. We cannot be filled with the Spirit until we are saved. So number one, the being filled with the Spirit is for the believer. Man. You cannot put new, uh, uh, new wine in old wine skins. What he wants to do is conform or transform the believer so that when I fill you with the wine of the Spirit, you can keep it. Yeah. Yeah. He says to her, this ain't, not, this ain't my wedding. I didn't pay for this. It's not my time, and I'm not doing this. And she ignores him. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like mothers do sometimes. Like he, she just, he said that I'm not going to do this. She looks past him and tells them, do whatever he says do. Because she had faith that if she put Jesus in a position, there would be a miracle that could happen. She forced his hand to say, look, there are people around you who have put an expectation on you. They are knocking at his door. He said he would answer the door if I saw him. He said he would be found of me. She is knocking on the door, and the the, the chalice to Jesus, are you going to answer the knock? If I go after you, are you going to respond to me? If I go after you and I ask you for something unreasonable, that's what she was doing. She was asking him for something that that had nothing to do with him, that that he even says to her, this has nothing to do with me. Yeah, but, but Jesus, I know that if I put enough pressure on your goodness, if I put enough pressure on your miracle working power, it will provoke a miracle. I heard what you said. I'm going to ignore it. I'm going to talk to these people around you. Whatever he says, do. You do it. And the Bible said that they brought water pots. They brought the water pots. He says, go get me some jugs of water. Let me put a pen right here. My, my grandmother... My grandmother, uh, one day, she was having some tax issues or something like that, and she wanted me to go with her downtown to the federal Dirksen building to, to talk to the federal agents to just work this out. So uh, this was maybe about two years before she passed or something like that. So we go down to the Dirksen building. I go with her to talk, and we're talking, Joyce, to the tax people. And if you knew my grandmother, she was a, a, a conversationist. She could talk about anything, talk all day about anything. At, at 90 years old, she had a lot to talk about. So uh, whoever she met, she would just basically tell them her life story. So I'm sitting there paying attention, not really paying attention. And, and so she begins to talk about how in the, the late 1920s and 30s, Marshall, that there weren't a lot of jobs for black men during that time. And one of the things that black men had to do, especially on the west side of Chicago, was that they had to, to find ways to make money. So they would, they would 
they would shine shoes or start newspaper businesses and get a route, and they would sell wine, she said. So this is what she's telling to the, talking to the federal agent. She says, my dad, my, my, my father sold wine in the neighborhood, and that's how he made, he made money. He would make his own wine, and um, he would sell it throughout the neighborhood, and that's how we ate sometimes. And she began talking, and I'm half paying attention to her. And she says that my father made wine. And so I stopped her. I said, wait a minute. Do you have a vineyard in your backyard? <laughs> she was like, no. I was like, well, if I know anything about wine, and they're made from grapes. And if you didn't have a vineyard in your backyard, then he wasn't selling wine. He had potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and technically what he was doing and I understand it he was making moonshine moonshine and wine are two different things because you don't make vodka or moonshine with grapes from what I read <laughs> let's preface that with what I read so I said your father in the 1920s was selling moonshine which I started doing the math on it, which during the years of prohibition. So what you have just done is tell this federal agent that during prohibition, your father was making wine. I looked at the agent and said, arrest her right now because her father broke the law. But here's my, here's my thing. My, my point is, is that, is that you make potatoes to make vodka moonshine, so I read, but you need grapes to make wine. Jesus had no grapes. All he had was what they gave him, which was water. How do you make wine from water? None of us, I would dare say, can make water from wine. It just does not happen. But here's my point, is that when God gets ready to bless you, he breaks natural laws. Yes, yes, yes. He, 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 he doesn't need the natural elements because you can say one plus one equals two, that he doesn't need grapes crushed to make wine. He says that when I'm ready to bless you and to fill you, I'll step over all the stuff you have and you do not have. I will look past all of your stuff, your issues, and I will fill you anyway because I am the God of miracles. Yes. The Bible says that they brought the, wine, the, the, the water pots to him, and all they had was jars of water. He says to them, pour into the water pots. Uh -huh. As they are pouring into these vessels, the water turns into wine. When they are obedient, and when the water pots are open, the molecular chemistry of the water changes right. from one thing uh -huh. to another. Yes. That's why we have to believe in the power of salvation, because God can take a drug at it right. yes. one yes. day. Right. But if, they're able, if he's able to pour himself yes. into it, he can change what is yes. natural yes. into supernatural. Yes. Yes. Right. Okay? Yes. So the Bible begins to say that, that the, the drugs were filled again. Here was the litmus test. He says, take this and give it to the feast commander. Uh -huh. The Bible says that the feast commander tasted it. Feast commander says to him, hmm, this was better than the stuff we put out at the beginning. He says what we understand is that you, you, you put out the good wine first and put out the lesser wine last because they're gonna be so drunk they're not gonna be able to tell whether it's good wine or not, but you have saved the best wine for last. And so the Bible says in the last days he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men to see visions. He says, this is what I'm going to do at the last of it. You are going to recognize that I am going to fill my saints with my spirit that your latter days will be better than your former days. So here's what he says. Paul says in Ephesians, and I'm finished, don't be drunk with wine. Yeah. In excess, yes. but be he filled yes. with the Spirit. Yes, he yes. says, This is the litmus test 
of you being filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourself, Amen. language, speaking to yourself in songs and hymns and spiritual songs. He says that we know you are filled with the Spirit when you start singing in a storm. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. When you start talking to yourself. Oh, yeah. That when you go through what you have to go through, he puts some wine down in you. Yeah. That wine is like an anesthetic. Yeah. All right. And I, 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 was, I was watching a documentary about the Civil War, and they didn't have anesthesia like we had, but they had a little wine, a little moonshine they would keep because when the pain come, they needed something to numb the pain. He said that I am going to know you are filled with the Spirit when the pain comes and you begin to medicate yourself with the Spirit. Yeah. That you begin to medicate your problems when you start getting happy and singing songs and making melody in your heart. He says, that's how you're going to know that you are filled with the Spirit. How many of you all want to be filled with the Spirit? Stand to your feet. I'll quit. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled. Yes, sir. You can be filled today. Periodically, we get worn down and we need to be filled again. I give a waitress a better tip Mm -hmm. when she don't let my water go too low. You should be able to see that I'm drinking this water and anticipate that I need some water and you never let me run out. God says that I see you. And if you want to be filled with the Spirit, I'll never let you get low. I'll keep filling your glass over and over again. And Acts says there will be times that we will receive a refreshing from the presence of the Lord. So here's what I want you to understand today, is that God desires to fill you. Fill you up. Be filled with the Spirit today. Bow your heads. Let me pray for you. God, I pray for every heart under the sound of my voice today. I pray for everyone who may be longing today, who may need something. All of us here have losses in our lives, and it creates holes and vacuums in our lives. But God, we know that you fill every empty place. So we open up our hearts to you, and we ask you to fill us. Fill us all over again. Give us this water that we may never thirst, that we may never thirst again. You said that if we would ask and that you would give it to us. So we pray, God, that we receive it now. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Every heart in agreement said amen. 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 Look at somebody, hug two or three people, tell them, don't be drunk with wine. But be filled with the Spirit. (laughs) Filled with the Holy Ghost. Don't do it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Bow your heads this morning. If you're here this morning, you say, I want to be born again. I want to be saved. I want to know who Jesus is. If you allow the Spirit to lead you today, He'll lead you to salvation. If you want to be born again, you can be born again. What must you do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and I shall be saved. If you're here today, you say, I want to be born again and I want Jesus to be Lord of my life. You can make that decision on today. If you're here and you say, I am born again, but I need a church family. I need to be a part of a family where I can hear the word of the Lord. And you want to be a part of the city of faith. Our hearts are open today and you can be a part of our family. God is so good. He's so good. He still saves. He still delivers. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Clap your hands. Give the Lord a praise this morning. Amen. I pray that you all were blessed by the word of the Lord.